Great, good afternoon. Welcome to the Institute for Government. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the director. Delighted to welcome Sir Anthony Selden here to talk about 10 things you should do as Prime Minister and 10 you shouldn't, but really how to be a good, a good Premier. Uh, a, uh, a question that could not be more lively. So uh, Anthony Selden, as you, as you know, is a prodigious historian, author of 40 books, including four on recent Prime Ministers and is the honorary official historian of number 10. And it's with that insight uh, that he's going to be talking to us as well, of course, as a um, uh, distinguished background in many areas and currently the Vice Chancellor of the University of Buckingham. So we're looking forward to this. He's going to talk for about 20 minutes. I'm going to fire some questions at him and then please get your questions ready as he is very willing to take all of them. Uh, Anthony Selden. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed. Can you hear this all right? Uh, thank you very much indeed, Bronwyn. It's a great delight to be here at this uh, sensational uh, organization, the Institute for Government. Uh, it is exactly the right body that the country needs, and it is uh, working in exactly the right uh, way. And it is uh, palpably improving the quality of government. So I am just thrilled uh, to bits to be here. Uh, and I see looking around the room, uh, many people have influenced my life uh, considerably. Um, uh, to pick out one rather than those who worked in government, um, one of those, those who are a prime student of government, and that is uh, Professor George Jones, who, when I was doing my A-level, I came across this character called George Jones writing about the power of uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, no less than 50 years ago, uh, George Jones at LSE was writing about this subject uh, and uh, is so much the uh, guru uh, on it uh, and inspired Peter Hennessy and I uh, 30 years ago to uh, establish the Institute of Contemporary British history with the uh, dream of bringing together the students of history, the researchers into contemporary history and the makers of contemporary history with the idea that we can all learn from each other. Uh, and that is, uh, body has had its own 30 year history. So, um, yes, uh, Bronwyn has given me 20 minutes and I've got 10 points to go through, uh, good points, 10 <laughs> bad points, that's one minute each. I've already used up 1.75 minutes, uh, <laughs> praising everybody and telling you that you're all marvellous. I'm going to use up just a bit more time now by saying that we have an obsession, not just in Britain, but uh, worldwide with looking at uh, what is wrong, um, uh, of being critical, and that's okay. Uh, that's okay, but uh, it is, there's another story, another way of looking at uh, reality, uh, which is to look at what goes well. The problem with the obsession with books about what's gone wrong, blunders, uh, tragedies, folly, uh, is that it makes us obsessed with uh, what's wrong, and of course journalists love that because journalists, if those present, uh, we love you dearly, um, uh, love what goes wrong much more than what goes right because there's no story in what goes right. The psychological problem with this is that what we concentrate on grows in our mind. So if we concentrate on what's wrong, we become obsessed by what's wrong uh, and that grows and grows and we become fear-obsessed, risk-obsessed, um, we become averse to uh, taking risks and we have altogether a negative view about ourselves. So last week I had uh, the greatest psychologist in the world in uh, London, uh, Professor Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania. Who is Martin Seligman? Uh, I had him talking to cabinet ministers and this is on the record, isn't it? I'll be careful. Um, uh, to people very important in Whitehall uh, about his work about what makes organisations flourish and thrive. What makes relationships flourish and thrive? What makes individuals flourish and thrive? The field of positive psychology uh, based at the University of Pennsylvania, 
evidence driven. He was invited in to help the US Army deal with its plague of um, uh, problems from those in it uh, after Iraq. And he has produced a great program that has increased productivity. Those organizations that concentrate on human flourishing and the well-being will see their productivity rise. Those that just concentrate and obsess by what's wrong will see uh, their productivity as well as their uh, well-being fall. So I'm very much, much more interested uh, in what goes well, uh, what to do, than this obsession with academics, with journalists, with us all, with what's wrong. So I'm going to talk about 10 things that's gone right. Now, if we look at prime ministers since the war, it is a pretty miserable tale in the eyes of uh, many people. We have, uh, first of all, Clement Attlee, who comes top, and we have Kevin Theakston over here, who is a key figure in uh, the assessment, uh, the most brilliant academic on assessing uh, <coughs> prime ministerial performance. Clement Attlee uh, comes uh, top all the time, but Attlee's own performance, interestingly, from uh, if you read Kenneth Morgan, on, uh, as I'm sure you all have, uh, on Attlee, his performance started to decline from 1947. And the success from 1945 to 47, uh, or indeed John Bew, uh, uh, was not uh, replicated, and there was a decline, and then a much more rapid decline, and his premiership fizzled out. The other um, most successful figure since the war, Clemens Margaret Thatcher, her premiership, fizzled out from 1987 and, like Atlas, ended in tears. So even, even the most, two most successful figures ended, unfortunately. Who else did we have? Churchill. Well, Churchill, we all know, don't we, uh, was hopeless as a post-war prime minister from 1951 to 55. Who followed him? Eden. Oh, my goodness, Eden. What a, what a disaster. Uh, he was at bottom of all the tables, um, uh, measured by almost any way. Macmillan wasted his opportunities, failed to uh, modernise the country, failed to get on top of the trade unions, failed to get into Europe, uh, failed all the way over, was followed by Douglas Hume, disaster. Wilson squandered that massive majority in 66 and did next to nothing. Did uh, what did? Well, he did the open university and some liberal reform, which, by the way, wasn't done by Wilson himself. What else did he do? A uh, bit paranoid. And then, thank goodness, we had Heath, who marvellously brought us into the uh, European Union. And uh, it was the best prepared government of any government. Contrast that with Theresa May. Um, he had five years of government. Read John Ramsden on this. Brilliant. Uh, it's the best prepared prime minister ever in history, or ever in 20th century history. Five years to prepare for it, working group after working group, working out, and by the end of it, uh, within five years, almost nothing left uh, of the Heath uh, record apart from Europe, and that's now gone. So then we had Wilson, 74, 76, uh, achieve very little. Uh, Callaghan, uh, well, the IMF, the uh, little... Um, uh, the error of not calling the election in this, in this autumn of 78 fizzled out after three years. Thatcher, we talked about, made, oh my goodness, John Major, what a disaster. We've all been led to believe John Major uh, was, I don't believe a word of that, by the way. And um, there are two people who worked in number 10, at least in the room, who worked with him, who uh, I agree with about that. But popular perception, major failure, Blair um, obliterated by Iraq. But I think more significantly, Look what he squandered, three massive majorities. What did he do? He promised he was going to transform Britain. <coughs> he promised he was going to transform Britain. He came in belittling the civil service, uh, thinking he knew everything about how to run the country. He achieved remarkably little. Uh, he, achieves, he achieved far more than Tom Bauer uh, thinks he achieved. Uh, he, Ireland, Northern Ireland, not the least of uh, several achievements, but compared to his advantages, he could have achieved much more. Brown, well, we know about Brown. I launched my book, Brown, at 10 here. Um, and Cameron. So 
here we have, what, what could these people, this is really interesting, if these people knew these 10 points, and these 10 points are distilled, Bronwyn, from, I haven't read anybody on this, I'm sure people, I'm sure there are academic articles on things that prime ministers should do. These are points distilled from writing four inside books on prime ministers over the last 25 years from 1990 to 2016 from John Major, and then writing books about most of the post-war uh, predecessors to Major who I talked about here. This is just my own thinking, and this is the first time, by the way, I've aired these points. Um, so uh, i expecting to get mown down on them, but this is what I would have said had I been presumptuous enough to go and see uh, Mrs. May. Uh, this is the point uh, that I would have said based on that experience of what works and what doesn't work. And the question is, can we learn? Are we capable, even if it's accepted, are they able to adapt their behaviours? Outliers become uh, presidents, prime ministers, leaders, outlying personalities. Part of the reason they've got there is because they have this very strong self-belief, which is often not very adjustable to taking on different ways of um, of, of thinking. But uh, I would say, uh, first point, and as it's such a short talk I'm giving, I am going to uh, have numbers. First point is secure the citadel. Get the staff in number 10 doing the right jobs. Five Ps, policy, politics, presentation, parliament, personnel, and hold on to them. And hold on to them. Uh, because uh, Attlee had his uh, great team, Rowan, Ricketts, Thatcher uh, had Ingham and Powell, um, had Butler, who she used extremely well as principal private secretary but didn't use well as cabinet secretary when he succeeded uh, Robert Armstrong the 1st of Jan 1988, um, and working with the cabinet secretary and your top civil servants, key George Jones point, uh, with your uh, civil servants in number 10, absolutely key uh, to successful prime ministers. So um, I wrote a book uh, on the 100th anniversary of the cabinet office, um, which uh, I wrote last autumn, published on the anniversary on the 9th of December 2016. There were wonderful events you can see on the website taking place here at the same time. Look at the IFG website for the events here. I'm sure some of you were at them. The point that hadn't struck me of the 11 cabinet secretaries working with the 18 prime ministers in the last 100 years is that where the PMs were successful, they worked with the cabinet secretary. So Lloyd George during the First War, but not after the First World War. Churchill during the Second World War with my uh, best uh, of all the 11 cabinet secretaries, Edward Bridges. Um, coming through Thatcher with Armstrong. Uh, th th these are successful relations. Where it goes wrong, um, Wilson with Trend, uh, Heath with Trend, and uh, uh, Blair with, Brid with, with Butler, who he called Old Buttleshanks. You, you would have thought that he would want to listen to the wisdom of this person who'd worked at the heart of government uh, for 35 years, but apparently not. Um, and then he chose Richard Wilson. He chose Richard Wilson. He chose Andrew Turnbull chose Gus O'Donnell from 2005 onwards. Uh, none of them were close or successful relationships. Without question, uh, that would have been more successful premierships had they listened. So first point, secure the citadel, get the right people in, trust them, listen to them. Secondly, is authentic voice. Many of these points, by the way, go with, for CEOs, I guess, although I haven't quite mapped them against CEOs. To, you've got to find your voice early on. David Cameron, who, by the way, uh, I ad like and admire greatly, never found his authentic voice. Um, uh, John Major did, but not totally. Um, if you don't find your authentic voice, the press will do it for you. And if you don't do it quickly, 
uh, and it has to be true to you and has to tell a story about why you want the job. No one quite knew why David Cameron wanted the job. Uh, and that was unfortunate because, in fact, there were things um, uh, that uh, there were things that were very true to him, not the least his experience with Ivan, which is when he was often at his most effective. Leaders are at their most effective when they talk from here, not there. Uh, and the nation needs to see the authenticity in a leader. The most successful prime ministers the last 100 years, we knew who they were, they were authentic. We could understand why they wanted to lead the nation. We trusted them. Uh, third, to be macro, then micro. You know, look back at these leaders. I remember uh, taking the children to see the grave of Harold Wilson on the Isle of... Uh, sorry, on the Isle of Scilly. And they said, what did he do, Dad? Um, and I talked to a prime minister just afterwards and, and, and told, told him about this. And I said, you know, really, you're only going to be remembered for one or two things, maybe three. Make certain they're things that you really want to uh, be remembered for. So get your macro sorted out and don't swallow it in the micro and talk relentlessly all the way through your premiership and then as you're coming to your legacy, talk them up in the legacy, get these things right. So, uh, and then do the micro. Many leaders of all kinds get swallowed in the micro. They say, you know, that time isn't my own. 85% of the PM's time is non-discretionary, re reactive. There's so little time. Um, so, fourth point is control your time. Make your uh, cabinet ministers, make your officials, make your team, them, do the work. Be very sparse in chairing cabinet committees. Um, typically, all prime ministers start out <coughs> thinking they're going to be... They react against... Look at this, look at this. They, we all do this. They react against their predecessor and promise the earth. So um, John Major's first cabinet, you know, it was all much more relaxed after the tension of, uh, of Thatcher, Blair, teed, uh, peed all over uh, uh, Major, Brown peed all over, you know, and, and, and on it goes. Actually, it's not very dignified. Um, it, it, it is... Um, you, uh, you, so you promise the earth, you promise you're going to be so different, you're going to chair, you're going to be in touch. Don't do too much. Don't stand back. Uh, carve out your time greedily for what? Resting, relaxation, reflecting. It's no good as a prime minister say there's no reflection time. Your fault, chum, make it. Enjoying yourself. Um, going on and staying on holiday. Don't be a martyr. Don't rush back. Make it absolutely clear that you're not going to do that. Fifthly, cabinet, be totally clear from the outset. You know, I'm also, uh, I've been ahead for uh, 20 years. I've absolutely adored being a head uh, teacher. I made my expectations absolutely clear from the very beginning who I was and what I was going to do, and I kept sticking on them. Of course, it's much easier, obviously, obviously, because I'm saying it's much easier to be a uh, head of a small institution, titchy little institution than running a country, but the same principles apply. Tell the cabinet what you want from them, keep them close, but not too close, keep them in order, and sack them when necessary. Sack them smartly, crisply, and find a, someone within cabinet to be your chief fixer who is totally loyal to you in and outside, whose job is uh, to be chief head prefect, using the head teacher analogy, to be head prefect to you as the head teacher. Um, and that person in cabinet, obviously, we could think of Willie Whitelaw, transparently successful in that job, uh, Heseltine to some extent with uh, Major, um, and uh, Churchill um, had... Uh, different figures when he came back in uh, power um, to some extent Butler uh, performed that role it, it's essential to have that person to school and discipline and nip at the heels of those who are stepping out of line the media uh, perhaps most controversially of everything I'm saying is 
get, again, the regime at the start. I'm, I'm amazed over the last 30 years how PMs have uh, fallen over themselves with the media. All this talk about 24 hours and you know, we're not the masters. I mean, either they are the masters, uh, the prime minister or the media is. You can simply make it clear the media needs the prime minister as much as or more than the prime minister needs the media. We think of John Major going over on his visit to see Bill Clinton and leaning over to talk to the journalist, wanted to be very super friendly, and why not? He is a very uh, genuinely kind and uh, human person, leaning over the seats to talk to the journalist, exposed his wife fronts, and then we know what happened to the cartoons about uh, his wife fronts. Uh, it is, um, there needs to be that distance with the media. Um, uh, be aloof, I would say. Uh, be regal. Uh, make it clear that you call the tune. Have a fight early on with the media and win it. Uh, make certain that they dance to your regi regime, not you dancing to theirs. Seventh is dignity and decorum. Now, the modern PM is half, if not more, head of state as well as head of government. Uh, the position of, uh, we have a remarkable, utterly remarkable head of state that might or might not change um, when uh, we have Charles as the uh, head of state, but already uh, the prime minister, without us <coughs> recognising it, it's steeled up on us, plays the role of, he of head of state uh, for much of the time. It's imperative that the uh, PM acts with decorum and dignity, uh, does not make cheap, snide comments, is aloof. Uh, we know that people are going to criticise you. We can make a comment about Donald Trump and being a big. You have to be a big person. You know, as head teachers, we know this. You don't, there are people who will be criticising you all the time. You cannot snap back. You can't use your authority. You get a quick chick, you get a, a quick, cheap laugh. You won't get respect from people. You get respect by showing uh, gravitas. Um, the PM is effectively foreign secretary now, the, taking the lead on security, the US, China, India, Russia, Europe, uh, the foreign secretary's role. The PM has been foreign secretary at periods uh, in the past. Um, uh, MacDonald was uh, his foreign secretary, Churchill in many ways, uh, was foreign secretary. Uh, the, uh, and he was also, when he came back, he was actually defence secretary. He, for a short while, the uh, position of um, the PM is to be foreign secretary effectively, so uh, acting that part. Uh, eight is seize the big moments and command them. I'm amazed by how often PMs don't do that, not just the party conferences, the big financial events, but the setbacks, the crises, setting the tone, leaving the footprint, seeing, as now it's almost an overworked fr phrase, don't waste a good crisis, um, but weaving everything into the big themes the Prime Minister has. Nine is uh, be very lean and very simple. So minimise what? Uh, lean, minimise reshuffles, uh, minimise initiatives, minimise relaunches, min minimise reactions, um, keep everything very steady, and 10 on the economy, the PM, as you all know, is First Lord of the Treasury, but cannot be. The PM must be effectively Foreign Secretary today, uh, is effectively half the job of, sec of Head of State, but cannot be Chancellor of the Exchequer nor Chief Secretary, despite titularly holding a senior position. So the PM has to find somebody as Chancellor of the Exchequer who they can trust, neither Poodle nor Tiger, because that relationship is going to make or break uh, the person. And I'm just going to do in one minute now, Bronwyn, and then over to questions. Things to avoid, 10 things to avoid, are uh, fiddling. Uh, secondly, overworking. Uh, fiddling uh, has broken, uh, has damaged most uh, prime ministers. Um, Churchill would read things in the paper after 1951 and phone up, he, he 
one of the things he got very upset about was myxomatosis. He read about rabbit, the rabbit population being wiped out, and, and Whitehall couldn't do any work for a week afterwards while it had a rabbit policy. Um, uh, overworking, overworking, uh, so that the leader can keep uh, their space. They all say they're going to do it, hardly any manage. Three, fighting with colleagues, uh, undignified, the PM will always lose. Um, fourthly, becoming angry and bad-tempered, while well, we think of Eden and Brown in particular, uh, but other prime ministers um, have been nipped by bad uh, temper. Um, Cameron at times, Major at times, uh, Wilson. It's a stressful job. You're more likely to do that if you are overworked. Uh, fifthly, putting the micro before the macro. All those prime ministers since 1945 have done that to some extent. Uh, six, obfuscating the truth. Uh, rush out with the truth. Get the truth out, whether it's about Trident uh, missiles uh, going a uh, wall or whatever it is. Um, don't listen to those people unless there is a genuine reason for national security. Uh, but is it genuine? Get it out, because otherwise you'll be on the back foot. Uh, seven, don't react, um, but act. Uh, eight, don't cheapen the office or descend to the level of the street. Um, whatever, in question times, in responses and speeches, uh, have that dignity and decorum. Nine, don't lose your cabinet. And ten, don't lose your cabinet. Um, um, most of the prime ministers and none of these prime ministers, with the exception of Wilson in 76, left at a moment of his own choosing. But Wilson was such an ineffective and broken man. Ken Stowe, who held the job of principal private secretary um, at the end um, uh, of Wilson and then was... Uh, Thatcher's first principal private secretary before Clive Whitmore took over, I remember saying to me, uh, it was hopeless trying to get a decision out of him after five o'clock in that 74, 76 period because his mind was just gone. Um, and drink. Um, so, and he would not have said that unless it was true. Um, so, uh, there we are. It's a... Um, uh, those are the points that I would say, and Bronwyn, over to thank you. you. Thank you. Anthony, thanks for that marvellous... Uh,